I've been telling you for two months, now one week, <laughs> that your life is going where your love is taking you. Your life is going where your love is taking you. If you want to fix your life, fix your love. Because love will always overcome whatever you try to do to resist it. Eventually it will win out and you will go with wherever your heart is. I've told you that you need to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's a good thing to love. That's a good direction to love. I've told you that you should love one another because that's the foundation of having great relationships. I've told you from the Bible that you should love your neighbor, anyone whose need you're close enough to see. Then it got tough. We said, you're going to need to love your enemy. Oh, Lord, help me. Mm. Then we said, we're going to love the master over money. And that was even rougher, wasn't it? And then we said, we're going to love your spouse. That was our Valentine's Day message. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Talked about loving humility and loving to serve. Because you were made to serve. And last week, I got into that kind of awkward thing of talking about loving spiritual leaders. You see why it would be awkward for me, right? So, uh, you know, I couldn't draft someone out of the pew to just do this, so I got to preach to you about how you should love me. Thank you very much. You know, not just me, but all spiritual leaders, if they are legitimate, if they are biblical, they deserve, in fact, we are commanded to love them. The Bible says, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you, to hold them in highest regard and love because of their work's sake. Live in peace with each other. You ever noticed how that soft, so often people get a negative attitude towards spiritual leadership and so often they can't even tell you Why? I can't count the times in my life, and I really feel that my wife and I have been really blessed because the Lord has given us favor, whatever church we were in, that we had a, a ton and ton of support, I'm, so it hasn't been a war that way, but I can't count the times I've looked at someone and said, what did I ever do to defend you? Why are you acting this way? Why, why are you trying to hurt me? What, what? And it always, I, I don't know. It's, you know what it is? It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. So when we find ourselves not loving our spiritual leaders, granted they are imperfect, very imperfect, but it's a spiritual thing with us. So we talked about loving spiritual leaders that required understanding their job description. Because a lot of times we get frustrated with spiritual leaders because they are working under one job description, we've got another job description for them, and they're not doing stuff that uh, they don't even know is their job, you know. One of my favorite things that people are always putting on me that I'm supposed to be doing is mind reading. <laughs> I, I, it always amazes me, and, and they'll be upset about something, and then uh, they'll tell me about it eventually after maybe months of being kind of in a bad mood or pouting or something, and, and then I'll, and I'll say, well, I didn't know anything about it. Well, you should have. How? You know. My favorite story is one time this, this lady, we were a pastor, I noticed she had a little bit of a bad attitude, and she just kind of, you know, and, and, and finally when I pinned her down, I said, what is wrong with you? What, what is it? What's this attitude? And she said, well, I told the Lord one day um, when I came forward for prayer, if you were really of God to, they, to tell you what was wrong with me. And I walked up to pray for her, and I had no idea what was wrong with her, and the Lord didn't tell me what was wrong with her. So I just prayed a very generic prayer, Lord, whatever the need is. And so she said, if you'd have been a man of God, you would have known what was wrong with me. And I said, okay, are you a woman of God? And she said, yes. I said, tell me what I'm thinking right now. Well, I said, same thing. I thank God I can't read your mind most of the time, you know. Would you want to read someone's mind? And you thank God I can't read your mind, be honest, you know. But it's a spiritual thing. So understand the job description, understand the barriers. We are so permeated with the message of rebellion that we think it's good. And you know, I think of the people who will be rude to a pastor and then they'll go around, well, I told him, as if it showed somehow they were courageous or something. It actually showed they had no spiritual depth. And the third hurdle is to know how to love a spiritual leader. 
What I tell couples all the time when they got marital problems is you don't know how to love your spouse. Sometimes when you have problems with spiritual leaders, you don't know how to love them. And so you're really blessed today that I'm going to give you seven ways to love your leader. <laughs> Just hop on the bus, Gus. Make a new plan. In the seven, if you're a child of seven, you remember that. How to love your leader. Number one, honor their leadership if it stands on a biblical foundation. Honor their leadership if it stands on a biblical foundation. He said, hold them as high, in highest regard and love because of their work. If their work stands on a biblical foundation, then honor it, right? Right? The Lord must be calling. <laughs> I have this theory <laughs> that a lot of times when someone is a little bit bent out of shape about something and they're a little offended at me or some other pastor and, and they won't do what the Bible says, the Bible says, come and talk to them. You know, it always amazes me when you hear through the grapevine, someone's got a problem with you, you know, and so you ha climb the grapevine back up <laughs> and you say, hey, what's going on? Why, why are you upset with me? And most of the time I found that the reason they won't come and say, here is my problem is because they know it will take about 10 seconds to deal with that biblically. It'll take about 10 seconds to say, well, wait a minute. What, what does the Bible say about this, see? So when we are at odds, and sometimes we should be offended at spiritual leaders. Sometimes we should be offended at the way they handle the Word of God. Sometimes we should be offended at the lack of spiritual depth in their ministry. We can be offended about all kinds of legitimate reasons. Maybe they're not praying enough to make good decisions. There are all kinds of reasons to be offended at spiritual leaders. Just make sure they're biblical, right? I'm not saying we're out of touch. I'm just saying make sure it's biblical. If you're going to stand and oppose a spiritual leader, say, I am going to oppose the spiritual leader because book, chapter, and verse. Right? Book, chapter, and because of this biblical issue. Otherwise, I have an obligation to honor spiritual leadership. And they all said, secondly, accept God's God's job description of spiritual leaders. So you'll have to review last week's sermon. There is that priority of prayer and the Word. There are those priorities. And if as a congregation we could begin to say, I am, my expectations of what a spiritual leader is going to be are going to be formed by the Bible. And I'm going to hold this leader accountable to what the Bible says his job is. I'm going to hold this spiritual leader to the accountability of what the Bible says her role is. I'm going to hold it to that particular point. In other words, to accept, like I said, you know, I've been in situations and denominational positions where I refereed church fights, and I could, I, we could have cleaned almost all of them up in just a few minutes of getting on the same page as to what the pastor's job is. And to take that from Scripture and accept the biblical standard. Or what a job, what the job description is. Number three, understand the sacred connection between God and those he's called to lead. Understand the sacred connection. Now, Jesus said this, and Luke recorded it. He who listens to you, speaking of the messenger, listens to me. He who rejects you, rejects me. But he who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. Here's the way it goes. The Lord said, I'm going to send you. And if someone rejects you, they're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And if they reject me, they're not really rejecting me. They're rejecting God the Father. How many have got that? That's, that's how that's flowing out. You see, if a messenger showed up at my doorstep tomorrow morning and knocked on the door and said, I am here on behalf of the President of the United States. 
I couldn't open it. We've got this, this nice little thing in our door. It's called a speakeasy. How many know what that is? You don't know what a speakeasy? It's this little window that you open and look out. It's called a speakeasy. It goes back to the days of Prohibition when they would look out the, to see if the coppers were out there, you know, before they opened the door, you know. It has been a, a blast. Because I'll look out the window and I'll see my wife coming down the sidewalk and I'll open the speakeasy and stick my face out there. <laughs> And when she gets to the door, she'll be humming or talking about something. And I'll go, hey. And she will absolutely flip out. It, it scares me the way she will. Just, you know, she still hasn't got used to a face in the door. And I've stopped yelling. I just start saying, hey. So, guys, if you really want to have fun with your wife, get a speakeasy door. It, it is, it's a blast. But let's suppose I open the speakeasy. You thought I lost where I was, didn't you? I, I, you open the speakeasy, and the guy says, I am here on behalf of the President of the United States, Mr. Donald J. Trump. Is, J is right, isn't it? And I have a message from you, from the President, and I, and, I, and I said, get out of here, and slammed the door and locked it. I wouldn't be rejecting the messenger standing at the door, right? I would be rejecting the messenger that sent the messenger. Are you tracking with me? I, I'm, I'm going to just shock the daylights out of you here. All right, you ready? It's just going to be incredibly difficult for some of you to believe. Preachers are very, very, very human. Very human. Very human. They have personalities. They're not just celestial beings dropped down from heaven. My wife thinks so. But everybody else knows that we have personalities, some of which you flow well with and some of which kind of grate you the wrong way. Um, we have limitations. We have patience issues. We have frustration issues. We get uh, angry like everybody else. I've often said the problem with ministry is that it takes place in the context of the minister's life. We never get to call time out to our own lives. We go through everything just the way you are. We go through the same issues. We are living in a marriage trying to keep that marriage healthy and keep it established right. You're, you're, you're trying to be a good parent, and, and you're dealing, you, at times you deal with rebellious teenagers. I'm looking over here and not over there. You know, you're, you're, you're dealing with, with all the stuff everybody else deals with, all the temptations, all the frustrations, all the disappointments. And in the midst of that, you're supposed to lead. See? And the reason I'm saying this is that People sometimes see the humanity of a pastor or a spiritual leader and decide to despise or doubt or criticize or all that because somehow they thought it was just a celestial being that's supposed to be dropped down from the sky and not have any human issues the way everyone else does. But he tells us to understand that there is a sacred connection between the messenger and the one who sent him. And I believe if you see someone who is truly spiritual, you will see someone who looks at spiritual leadership with such a degree of respect. Not because that person has got all the kinks worked out, but because that person is a messenger of the Most High God. Hello? Is a messenger of the Most High God. And so they are careful what they do in relation to that messenger, not because, again, they've got it all worked out, but because of the one that they represent. Jesus said to the apostles, go. The people who reject you, I'll deal with them. Just go. They're actually rejecting me. You see, let me move to four. It'll help us a little bit. Reject the temptation to resist without biblical grounds. Wow. Wow. Hebrews 13, 17 says, obey them. And we talked about that last week. It's not talking about letter of the law obedience. It's talking about giving honor and, and attention to what is being said. So if their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. 
You know what I've found? That some people have an appetite for roast preacher. They do. They have an appetite for roast preacher. They leave church, they sit down for lunch, and they have a side order of roast preacher. And 99% of that stuff I never even hear about, but what always worries me is the kids who hear it. The other people in the family who hear it that are soured or turned off or in some way turned against the work of God because of the roast preacher that they're constantly getting served up every Sunday. Um, They have become tools of the devil, and they don't even know it. Because, again, they're attacking a human being because of some, something they say without realizing that they are attacking someone who is tied to the message of God. So there is a cure for this. Resist the temptation to resist without biblical grounds. That's it. Again, that's all I can say is, is you know, if, if a spiritual leader needs to be resisted, do it. Be, have the courage to do it. Have the courage to speak truth to power. I, I get all that and I absolutely agree. I just disagree with being contrary for the sake of being contrary. And they all said, <laughs> they said, hey, amen. What about you guys? You know. There's one thing I've noticed and I've tried to tell people. Once you get an appetite for roast preacher in the body of Christ, you will become lonely. Because people will start backing away from you. I've seen it, I started to say a thousand times, but that'd be exaggeration. And celestial beings don't exaggerate. You know. Once you get an appetite and you start sniping at spiritual leaders, watch it. I have seen it happen, and, and eventually someone is walking through saying, I don't have any friends. No wonder. People don't want to be around someone who's always sniping at their pastor. They don't want to be around someone that they're having to defend their pastor with. They they don't want that. So before you know it, you're lonely. You can't get any fellowship because people don't want to be a part of that undercurrent. So critics always lose influence. Always lose influence. You know who spiritual leaders listen to? This is kind of a seminar on how you can love me, remember? Uh... You know who they listen to? You guys want to know what we're? You listen to people that you believe love you and that you believe have been praying. When those people come to you and say, Pastor, I don't know about what you're doing right now, or I don't know about that decision. Can, we, can I at least point some stuff out to you? The first thing that happens when you attack is we throw up a wall. It's like, okay, you know, I I can't let this person speak into my life. If I do, they will destroy me. So I've, I've got to put up a wall there. But when you know someone loves you and they love the call of God on your life and that they're only speaking because they want to warn you or help you see something perhaps you haven't seen, then you open up and you listen. So if you have influence, it's because you have love. It's because you are a person that protects. Number five, place biblical value on the work of spiritual leaders. He said, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of a double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. Is that what the Scripture says? Did you think some preacher wrote that and stuck it in there? The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of a double honor. When I was writing this sermon, I, I thought of a lady that some of you know, many of you don't because time has passed, but when, I, when Vivian and I first came here, there was a lady by the name of Edith LePay. Anybody remember Edith? Edith LePay. Edith LePay, and I, and I remember standing here and preaching her funeral a few years ago. She was, uh, dare I say, and, and I hope this goes over well for any of her family, but she was very blunt. You know, you just rah, you know, she'd just kind of bark out whatever opinion she had, you know. And so you kind of learn dealing with Edith that, you know, you, you were gonna always know where she stood. I remember one Sunday night I stand there and I was preaching from John and I mentioned something, uh, I forget what it was, and she said, Pastor, that's not in chapter eight, that's in chapter nine. 
I said, I stand corrected. We're in chapter 9, you know. And I just went on, and, and that night when I got home, uh, she called me. And she said, Pastor, I just want to apologize to you for the, for the way I interrupted you and talked to you tonight. I feel so convicted in my spirit. And I said, who are you and what did you do with Edith? Edith was a woman of God, and she was a woman of the Word. Uh, again, she was, she was very blunt, but she was a person. And the Holy Spirit began to deal with her and say, Hey, there was a little something in that question today you, you need to make right with the pastor. And she didn't hesitate. I mean, we were only an hour out of service. She was tracking me down to say, Please forgive me for that. When I was first in the ministry, I was, um, I think it was the second church my wife and I pastored, Um, I was about 22 years old, and I looked 12. (laughs) I did, I did. Literally, a vacuum cleaner salesman came to the door one day, and he said, excuse me, son, is your mom at home? I'm not making that up. I mean, I looked like a kid. I was married, but still, I looked like... But anyway, I was past, we were pastoring this little church, and uh, my superintendent came to preach one Sunday night, and he got up and he said something to the congregation that I'll never forget, and it stuck in my spirit, because I was, we were pastoring my home church. And uh, he said, I want to admonish this body tonight. He said, I listened to the conversations before service, and he said, I want you to stop calling your pastor Jeff. It is not Jeff. It's Pastor Jeff. Or it's Brother Davidson. Or it's Reverend. No, 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 not Reverend. Twelve-year-olds can't be called Reverend. And he went on to give them a lesson on respecting spiritual authority. I never forgot. And to this day, it's been probably 10 years since then. (laughs) You know, it's been... uh, Every time a person I'm pastoring calls me Jeff, it sticks in my ear. I go... "Hmm." And I know that most people don't even mean anything by it, but it always sticks in my ear. And I think back to Samuel Sark saying that. I remember one time I told this story and after service this guy walked up, looks at me kind of like, well, who are you? He said, Jeff, how you doing? And, and I just sort of walked on. But I thought to myself then, that is between you and God. That, that thing you just pulled is between you and God because you see, honor is always between you and God. Um, it's not my job to make you feel right. It's my job, hopefully, to help it be easier for you. But it's your job and your relationship to God to whether or not you honor spiritual leadership. Amen? Are you trucking with me? Number six, it doesn't get any easier. Accept your biblical responsibility to finance the ministry of preaching. Can I tell you something? How many would like me to tell them something today? Tell them something. You, you have to understand the Levites, the Leviticus priesthood, to understand what Paul is about to say here in Corinthians. So let me tell you how it went. Here's how the Leviticus priesthood went. When the children of Israel invaded the promised land, and, and they took the promised land back from the Canaanites and the Jebusites and all the ites, and uh, then they were dividing up the land among the 12 tribes of Israel, God said... Divide it up 11 ways because the tribe of Levi will not receive an inheritance. Their job will be to scatter out among the other tribes and stand before you in ministry and remind you of what God said and how to live in fellowship with God. So I'm not going to give them any land to plow. I'm not going to give them any inheritance. Their job will be to keep you focused on God while you go about your careers. Now, understanding that, you can begin to understand now 
what Paul is saying here when it comes to the ministry. He said, don't we have the right to food and drink? And I, I think I probably got to do a little more setting up here. Is Paul was preaching and making tents. He was making tents. So six days a week he made tents and one day a week he preached. And he was trying to say to the churches, I really need this tent making business off of my back so I can preach seven days a week, you know. And, and so there was this, we call it bivocational thing going on. And now he is fighting with the Corinthians because he said, you guys need to support the preaching of the word. And they're saying, you know, if you were right with God, you wouldn't even ask for that. You wouldn't even want us to do that if you were right with God. So now he says, don't we have the right to food and drink? In other words, at your expense. Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Peter? He said, don't we have the right to have a family, again, at their expense? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Are we the only ones that have to make tents? The other apostles don't, so why should we? And then he sk I'll skip down just for sake of time. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, why shouldn't we have it all the more? In other words, if you're going to send off your money to those big TV preachers, why shouldn't that apply to the ones right there among you who are there for you when you really need help? Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar... In what is offered at the altar? Now here is the crux of the matter. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Now what he's simply saying is, if God has called some to leave secular careers and give themselves full time to keeping people in touch with God, in touch with the Word of God, keeping focused on God, he said there is a value in that. And he's coming back to saying, unless you help finance the preaching of the gospel, you haven't begun to understand its value. As long as you get offended at sermons like this, as long as you take whatever funds you get and you go buy your video games or your new car or you make the big house, and you don't see any reason at all to make sure that the church can afford staff. To make sure that there are people who have been called out of a career and have been commanded by God to leave it behind. And you don't see any value. I've had people say, well, why in the world would I give anything to the church? Man, I could give that to the cancer society. I could... and, and I say the answer to that is very simple. If what's happening right now has no value to you, I understand it. If what happens every Sunday morning around here has no value, I get it. But, but, if you walk into this building and you're fed from the Word, and your children are fed from the Word, and you are led by a, an anointed, spirit-directed music program, if that means something, you have a responsibility to help make that happen financially. And if you don't, you don't know, you've you placed no value on that. You're saying, in fact, I would suspect, do you feel me getting anointed now? <laughs> I just hope it's God, you know. Yeah. In, in fact, if you have reached a point where you say, I'm never giving a dime to anything, what are you saying about the value of what's happening here? I bet, I bet that many of you came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ after the preaching of the gospel. And there's no value in that? You have no responsibility to make that happen? Really? 20 trips to McDonald's a week is more important than that? You know, Texas Roadhouse is more important than that? I get it. But really? Really? And see, that is the, the amazement that Paul has. If you read this whole chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, it's the same thing. Paul is saying, listen, if anyone understood the value of the preaching of the word, it should be you guys because you were all a bunch of pagans. Now, I'm not talking to you. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the Corinthians. You see, you guys didn't even know Jesus till I showed up in Corinth. 
And I started telling you about Jesus, and God started working in your lives, and he, he brought you out of all that filth, and he's saying, how in the world can you dare not support that now? How, how can you not? Think, the, now, again, this is, this is rhetorical, but I just want you to think, where would you be without God-called prophetic ministry in your life? And if you can say, oh, it was optional, I could be fine, I get it. But if you can say, it was critical, absolutely critical. There have been times in my life, had God not spoke to me through the preaching of the word, I would have been wrecked myself. And why in the world would you be offended at the idea of helping make it happen financially? It's a manifestation of greed that destroys our spirituality. And they all said, ooh, glad that's over. Number seven. I am at number seven, aren't I? Try to comprehend the devil's hatred for spiritual leaders. I'm not asking you to pull out a violin and start playing a sad song. I, I just want you to understand some things that might be confusing you. There is a biblical principle that works like this. Are you listening? Smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. The devil loves that principle. Uh, I, pr I hope that you know. I used to say this a lot. But let me remind you in case I haven't said it enough lately. I am the most humble man you've ever met in your life. <laughs> just, just so you, you know that. But the single most devastating thing that could happen to relevant church right now is for me to crash and burn spiritually. Or for my wife to. The single most devastating thing that would put this church in a tailspin is to have the pastor fall. The devil knows that, and he's obsessed with making it happen. I talk to the staff every once in a while. I say, do you guys realize how devastating it would be if the enemy gets you? You've got to walk circumspectly before. Do you understand that? You guys understand what the devastation it would have. And so the devil is obsessed with the destruction of spiritual leaders, and he never stops. I mean, imagine, if you're not on this side of the pulpit, maybe, but imagine every day you get up knowing that the devil is absolutely obsessed with bringing you down. And some people say you're paranoid, but it's not paranoia if someone's out to get you. That was a joke. But that is the truth. When God calls you into ministry, it always kind of gets me when God calls a young person into ministry and the parents are, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, do you have any idea what they just stepped into? Do you have any idea what's ahead for them? Every day of their life, henceforth, the devil will have a special target on their back and he will work 24-7 to bring them down. We have a thought, maybe only pastors know about this, so I'm betraying a trade secret. It kind of works like this, just in case sometimes you may look at us and think we're a little aloof. The question is, when someone moves close to you relationally, is shall I burden you with my friendship? Because the moment you get close to me or my wife, the enemy's going to start working on you. Because when a friend betrays us, because the enemy's worked all the time, it cuts you open and you struggle to get back on your feet for a while. And every pastor, every one of us, know what it is to believe that you've got a friend you can absolutely trust and the next thing you know, they're stabbing you in the back. And so after a while, we wonder, okay, you want to be my friend? I don't know if you really do. Because when you move into my world, the enemy will work night and day to get you to turn on me, to get you to hurt me, to get you to do something to trip me up. Are you sure? 
you want to sign up for that? Oh, yeah, I will. Well, wait a minute, you know. Uh, are you sure you want to sign up for that? Every friendship is a target for acts of betrayal. Uh, the tempter never stops looking for weaknesses. And so I would say to you as someone who's walked this path for a few decades, how do you love a pastor? How do you love a spiritual leader? Understand that. Understand that. When you pray, pray with that in mind. When you decide whether or not to get upset or offended about something, keep that in mind. That, that the burden that we carry, I, I know this sounds self-pity and I don't mean it to be that when I'm, I will be absolutely glad when this sermon's over. I promise you that, you know. But it's part of the word and I can't back up on the word. This is what it says. And so to understand and try to comprehend how much the enemy hates spiritual leaders. How much the enemy tries to hurt spiritual leaders. And if you really want to love a spiritual leader, you sort of circle the wagons. And you get protective. And you certainly don't allow or get involved in anything that is hurtful or discouraging. You let a spiritual leader be human, and you're patient and you're gracious. And you understand that if you're not there, you have no idea what that level of spiritual conflict is. So you just give grace, and you give grace. So I told you just a few minutes ago, I'm going to give you seven ways to love a leader. <laughs> Are you happy you know? What about the other 75% of you? Are you happy you know? It's part of loving. I know I'm, I'm out of time, and I'm... I'm I'm, I'm truly wrapping up here. But I want you to listen to me very, very carefully. Are you listening? Just over your stomach growling, I want you to listen to me. I say this because it's true, not because it will help me. <laughs> I'm saying it's because it's true. You will never reach your potential unless there are spiritual leaders in your life that bring out the best in you. You never will. You can say, well, i got a direct line to God. That doesn't change the fact that God set the church up this way. And to some, he gave the gift of leadership. And he appointed elders over us. You and I will never play the Lone Ranger game and get where we need to be. If you are going to do great things for God, it's going to be because you got in the presence of spiritual leaders who brought out the best in you, who challenged you and encouraged you and rebuked you and admonished you. At times, they yanked your chain. At times, they threw you a rope. Hey, I just thought of that. Wow, that's, that's neat, you know. <laughs> Write that down. Oh, man, I got you know, got to get I must be anointed now, you know. But you will know. It's, it's that critical. I mean, I feel awkward up here talking about this for obvious reasons. But when it boils down to it, I know and I need you to know that you will never get there without leadership. You'll never arrive where you want to be. And right now, you know, Jason talked a few minutes about a wall. And I feel that wall even now because some of you... I'm speaking prophetically now. You, to be honest, you've not been very teachable. And I don't, I don't have anybody in mind, I promise. It, you get there and you go, well, I am who I am. You're like Popeye, I am who I am, you know. <laughs> Instead of saying, you know, I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived yet. I need anointed leadership in my life to help me get to the next level. And quit dragging your feet and trying to find reasons not to and, and getting all... Just, God, I choose to love leadership because you tell me to. I choose to love leadership because it's part of the way I love you and it's part of the way I love the life you're creating for me. Amen? Amen. Stand with me, please.